Amen. All right. Well, if you uh, saw my video on the eight super signs, then you know that I mentioned uh, Planet X. But we didn't talk much about it, so we're going to take a couple of sessions to talk about Planet X. You may have heard of it. You may not have heard of it. It doesn't matter because today will be uh, an introduction to the search for Planet X. I'm going to cover a lot of biblical events uh, without going into any explanation or details. So I am assuming that you have some knowledge and foundation of biblical events. If you don't, you can catch up using the uh, curriculum that we've taught in our church twice now, the 4,000 years of history, and it takes you from uh, creation to Christ in 12 hours. And the reason we do that is because it's impossible to understand the end without the beginning. It's impossible to understand prophecy without history. So this is history that God has given us and it's relevant. It helps us to understand eschatology. Okay, why should Christians care about Planet X? I want to give you an introduction to the planets for those who don't know astronomy. Then we're going to give you an introduction to miracles to those who don't know theology. Then we're going to combine the two to understand biblical, what I call biblical astronomy or scientific miracles. Does that sound fun and interesting? I hope so. I hope you'll be uh, paying attention the whole time because it will all come together at the end. This is one of those messages where you really need to see the pieces come together. So stick with it. This is not one of those videos you want to watch for just like five, ten minutes. You want to just pay attention the whole way. All right, let's go uh, to the planets. There are six planets that are visible to the naked eye. Uh, therefore, they were never discovered because they've been known since ancient times. Uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. The seventh planet was discovered in 1781 and was given the name Uranus. Uranus is the creator god in Greek mythology, and I think these numbers are all significant. Okay? The meaning of numbers are covered in my book, The Divine Code. Seven is the number of God, and the first planet to be discovered was the seventh planet. It's like the fingerprint of God there that he wants to be discovered. He's made things to be discovered, including himself. He's not trying to make it difficult. But Uranus was discovered in 1781, and scientists found something strange. Uranus was not uh, behaving according to their mathematical models or their expectations. Uh, it was perturbed. So a scientific term I want to teach you is per uh, perturbation, which means the complex motion of a body subject to forces other than the gravitational attraction of a single other massive body. In other words, the motion is not simple, it's complex. Therefore, it hints at other forces tugging at it. What would you do if you didn't understand the behavior of a planet? I can think of three options. Number one, would you say, Uranus, you're wrong. Or, you could say, our model based on Newton's law of gravitation is wrong. Our assumption is wrong, which may be true, because now people are uh, opening up to the idea that the strong force in the universe is not gravitation. We've always known that. But uh, the electromagnetic force is much stronger, and so we live, probably we live in an electric universe, not a gravitational universe. So maybe the model is wrong. Or we say, third option, the model is right. Newton's law of gravitation is basically right. And this suggests the mass of an unseen planet. And so the eighth planet, Neptune, was discovered in 1846 because scientists took the third option. Neptune's discovery was a vindication of Newton's law of gravitation, although it doesn't explain everything. And sometimes I wish people would treat the Bible with the same wisdom that we do the planets. What do I mean by that? The Bible is something to be discovered. It's something to be mined. It's not something that you read once and you can just say, you know what, I basically know the Bible. For instance, what would you do if you didn't understand a verse in the Bible? Would you say, Bible, you're wrong. A lot of people say that. Or you could say, my understanding of the Bible must be wrong. Or third option, 
There is another verse waiting to be discovered, tugging on this verse. Give you an example. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And a lot of people read that and they feel perturbed. They think, well, what's wrong with this? Is God teaching Christians to hate their parents? Well, what do you need to do? Instead of accusing the Bible is wrong, you say, I need to put this in the context of other verses. For instance, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So the word hate obviously has to be put into that context. It just simply means to love someone more than. You go to John chapter 19, verse 26 to 27, you find the heart of Jesus. What was he like? Was he a mother hater? Did he uh, dislike his parents? Of course not. When he was suffering excruciating pain on the cross, he didn't think about himself like most of us would. Look at what Jesus said. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, here's your son. In modern English, here's your son. Then he said to this, the disciple, there's your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his home. So John basically adopted Mary as his mother and took care of her until the end of her life. So what was Jesus really saying in the first verse that we read? Simply put, God must be number one. See, some people use their love for family as an excuse to not come to church. Don't do that, Jesus is saying. Some people are willing to give money to their parents or to their children, but not to missions or God's work. And Jesus is saying, Put God first, and then you can still do the rest. Amen? But God deserves to be number one. Can you say amen? amen. Good. All right, so Neptune's orbit, once they discovered Neptune, also had perturbation, which led to the search for the ninth planet. There it is. The ninth planet, Pluto, was discovered in 1930. However, as you all would have heard back in 2006, Pluto was demoted, too small, and now we call Pluto not a planet, but a dwarf planet. So there remains uh, eight planets. This is what our current model of the solar system looks like, eight planets, and then five dwarf planets, named Ceres, Pluto, Makemake, Haumea, and Eris, which is the farthest, but the biggest one. Okay, so if you didn't know that that's where we live, this is our home. We live in the solar system and this is what it looks like to us currently. Happy? Didn't lose anyone? Good, all right. So then the search continues. Based on real hardcore science, we have found some planets out there and planetoids, dwarf planets, but we haven't accounted for what is perturbing Uranus and Neptune. So we sent out Pioneer 10 on the 3rd of March, 1972, I believe to find out this extra body. And they say the mission was to study the outer low so solar system. Unfortunately, we lost contact with Pioneer 10 on the 23rd of January, 2003. So it's gone, battery's out. We then sent Voyager 1 on the 5th of September, 1977, and it actually entered interstellar space on the 25th of August, 2012. So we've got something, the farthest thing out there uh, made by man is Voyager 1. Interestingly, that this time when we sent it, we sent it with a golden record to communicate with aliens. So for those of you who don't believe that NASA and these guys have an alien agenda, you gotta ask yourself, why did they send a record made of pure gold with a message for extraterrestrial life? And they did it again with Voyager 2, which was sent a few days earlier on the 22nd of August, 1977. 
It was sent before, but it's called Voyager 2. Why is that? Because they knew it would move slower. So Voyager 1 has overtaken Voyager 2. Now slow, by the way, how slow is slow? Voyager 2 is traveling very slow at 15 kilometers every second. Think about that. It's mind-boggling. Voyager 1 is traveling at over 17 kilometers per second. So every time I go like this, it's just gone, phew, another 17 kilometers. And it also carries a second golden record to communicate with aliens. Hmm. We're not making this stuff up. So Voyagers 1 and 2 are out there in this traje trajectory. And according to military sources, President Eisenhower in his second term in office was briefed about the existence of the 10th planet. And Pioneer 10, Voyagers 1 and 2 were sent to triangulate the location of planet X. This is not something that we, are, uh, we alone are aware of. Back in 1983, there was news, uh, New York Times is, you know, the biggest newspaper at that time. And they reported on the 30th of January, 1983, something out there beyond the farthest reaches of the known solar system seems to be tugging at Uranus and Neptune. The, presence, uh, the force suggests a presence far away and unseen, a large object that may be the long sought planet X. Uh, Washington Post says, mystery heavenly body discovered. Actually, they made an announcement that they discovered this. It's kind of like a slip up because after they said this, it just vanished. The news vanished. But this is what it, it says on the 30th of December, 1983, a heavenly body possibly as large as the giant planet Jupiter has been found in the direction of the constellation Orion by an orbiting telescope ab aboard the U.S. infrared astronomical satellites. Very important that it's an infrared because it's, it's a dark planet, so it's hard for everybody to find. Infrared telescopes can find them. Now, this is Dr. Jerry uh, Neusbauer of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's quoted as saying, all I can tell you is, we don't know what it is. And after this statement, the news of it just disappeared. But it keeps resurfacing. This is the National Geographic says, new planet found in our solar system, question mark reported on the 11th of May, 2012. Uh, just a few days ago, just as I was preparing this, I thought, man, confirmation, because two news articles came out. Number one, uh, Infowars, Alex Jones interviewed Bob Fletcher. And when I quote newspapers or internet sources, I'm not endorsing everything they say. I'm just saying it's in the news. Alex Jones interviewed Bob Fletcher, the investigative reporter who uncovered weather control technology back in 1985 when nobody believed that that was possible. Now we know China used weather control technology to keep the rain away from the Olympics, right? So there are things going on which a good reporter would be able to find, but at the first, you know, at first uh, revelation of it, it just seems absurd, it seems ridiculous, but now it's not. Well, the same investigative reporter now says that he believes Planet X is coming back and the U.S. government is actively preparing for it. And this was quoted on the 23rd of September. So you can just count the days, only a few days ago. All right, also on the same day, I don't know why, but it just happened this week. 23rd of September, 2013, documentary filmmaker Bart Siebel wrote, I was first told about Planet X by a high-ranking source at NASA in or about 1989. Now let me read you a quote from what Bart uh, says. And we're in touch, actually I'm in touch with these reporters, the astronomers, I've actually been communicating with them. Um, so I'm getting this information firsthand. Uh, Bart uh, said, they said, this is the NASA source, its dramatic gravitational effects would cause apocalyptic disasters upon the entire Earth. The planet is pitch black and near the temperature of absolute zero, requiring very specialized infrared satellites to be observed, which only the U.S. government owns, or, you know who else owns it? The Vatican and they call it the Lucifer Infrared Telescope. Well, why did the Pope call the world's best and privately owned infrared telescope Lucifer? Because it was specifically designed to track planet X, whose nickname is Lucifer. What does Lucifer mean? It means the day star. Well, what's a day star? It's a star that you can see in the day. So they're looking for something that won't be trackable through normal telescopes, but when it gets close enough, it's gonna be able to be seen during the day. It's also called the great uh, dragon, right, or the destroyer. Hints of planet X approaching. 
Well, we know that right now, this is what we, this is what we know. The magnetic poles are moving at about 600 feet per day, unprecedented. Something is disturbing it. There are unpredictable comets and asteroids thrown out of their normal orbits. If you don't know, uh, there were two uh, bright meteors yesterday in America and Canada. And they never gave any warning. It just boom came, you know. If it, could, if it actually landed, then it would, would be too late. There are increasing earthquakes caused by a tugging at Earth's crust. If you don't know that Yellowstone is uh, one big gigantic volcano waiting to erupt, um, that's what it is. It's a national park in America, and for the first time, there have been three swarms consecutively. The guy who's been studying this for 50 years says he's never seen anything like it. it. just happened last week. Sinkholes, all right, are appearing everywhere. Uh, there's a release of un underwater methane, which is a toxic gas that may be responsible for killing all the sea creatures that we keep seeing washed up, you know, on the news. And then the government is buying up ammunition and giving police armored vehicle, it seems, in preparation for martial law, this, the U.S. government. And there's nine U.S. $9 trillion missing in what are so-called black budgets. And I watched this. Um, this is a real hearing in Congress. U.S. Representative Alan Grayson questioned the Fed Inspector General Elizabeth Coleman on where the nine trillion dollars of off-balance transactions have gone. And she just danced around for a long time like she didn't have to answer anybody. And her reply was absolutely audacious. She said, we have no jurisdiction to investigate the Federal Reserve's transactions. And she's the inspector general. That means she's the head inspector of the balance sheet. And she can't account for nine trillion dollars. And so what the conspiracy theorists say and this is certainly food for thought for them. I'm not saying I subscribe to it, but what they're saying is it seems like the U.S. is funneling government uh, money to build something. I mean, what would cost $9 trillion to build? Well, there are reports of huge underground bunkers and subterranean networks being built all throughout the United States. The question is, what for? Now, here's the official statement from NASA. NASA absolutely denies that there's any, you know, doomsday. We know that's wrong because we believe the Bible, but let's take it for, let's take their word. They say, people have been decrying the end of the world for hundreds of years to no avail. This is Nola uh, read on May 2012. Of course, that sounds a lot like 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter said 2,000 years ago, knowing this verse, that scoffers will come, when? In the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? So we know that they're going to say that already, and then they say it, which fulfills prophecy. They don't even know it. And realize that not everything that comes out of NASA's mouth is gospel truth. Um, they're the same people that believe that life on Earth came from Mars. Okay, so not everything that NASA says is real science. NASA has a strong alien agenda. The search that they're on is not merely for life on other planets. Like, you know, if you discover microbes or grass or, you know, uh, dandelions or something on another, another planet, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? But that's not what they're looking for. They're not looking for grasshoppers. They're looking for extraterrestrial creators. So millions of dollars are spent in vain on what's called astrobiology to convince people that God did not create us. Be aware, beware of the expert fallacy. Such things as global warming. What is expert fallacy? Well, it could mean two things. Number one, assuming someone is an expert who's not, such as a celebrity or a politician. And here Al Gore, who has no scientific background, claims to be an expert on global warming. Number two, the expert fallacy means assuming experts are never biased or dishonest. If you think about it, in science, the experts are often motivated by funding. Therefore, experts have more to lose, far more to lose, than amateurs by adopting unorthodox views. In fact, unorthodox views are usually considered competition to them. And so they, as peers, would review out any competitive ideas from uh, the science. So, you know, global warming, I've been saying for a long time, don't believe it. God, has, didn't, God, God didn't make the earth to be destroyed by man. Man is not that big to destroy it. Um, but finally in the news, look at this, 30th of March, 2013, 
Mail Online, government's climate watchdog launches astonishing attack on the mail on Sunday for revealing global warming science is wrong. Listen to this, 8th of September, 2013, The Telegraph, global warming? No, actually, we're cooling. And that's what we're finding out right now is the temperature of the earth is actually cooling. So what happened? So they changed global warming to climate change. Well, what does climate change mean? There's always climate change. Climate's changing all the time. Every time there's summer, the, some of the ice caps are going to melt. You take a photo of ice caps melting, it doesn't mean anything. Every summer it melts. But you know that now there are more ice in the nor North Pole than ever before? More ice is forming. Well, they have a hard time now giving us the carbon tax, right? So we repealed it because it's an expert fallacy. This is absolutely wrong. The whole world, John said, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Unless you read the Bible or come to a church that teaches the Bible, you probably believe more lies than you would care to admit or examine. So NASA, let's take a look at this. NASA definitely denies that anything is coming and, you know, they don't believe in a doomsday. And by doomsday, by the way, I'm not trying to scare you. The earth is not going to be destroyed. Jesus is going to come back and get rid of sinners. That's a good thing. All right, so evil will end on the earth, but the earth will always continue forever and ever. And we who believe in Jesus will continue with him. Amen? But today, there are thousands of amateur astronomers and privately funded astronomers who can surpass NASA. In fact, David Morrison, the senior scientist at NASA Astrobiology Institute, acknowledges, quote, NASA and the government gets most of their information from these outside astronomers, not the other way around. So uh, don't just dismiss someone because they're not NASA. Did you know that mus a musician discovered, an amateur astronomer, a musician, discovered Uranus in 1781? A Canadian writer, David Levy, discovered 22 comets, including the one that bears his name, Schumacher Le Levy 9, that struck Jupiter in 1994. A construction manager named Thomas Bopp co-discovered the comet Hale Bopp in 1995. Two Russian astronomers discovered Comet Ison, which is what we're expecting on Hanukkah, right? That's in the eight super signs. Australian as amateur astronomer discovered uh, the sudden flash on Jupiter in 2009. That's still a mystery. We don't know what that flash was. It was like it just gave a signal out. I like this one the most. Uh, this is a fellow minister, the preacher of the gospel. Australian retired minister Robert Evans uses his photographic memory to spot new lights in the sky. He holds the world record for discovering supernovas, 42 so far. He uses a 12-inch telescope on his back porch. He has also written seven books on Christian revivals in Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Islands. How cool is that? Amen? And here's another cool guy, Gil Broussard. He's a Christian amateur astronomer, and we've been communicating uh, a lot, and he's been studying the evidence for Planet X by combining our knowledge of astronomy with the Bible. And Planet X could account for more than the orbits of the outer planets. It may also account for the anomalies that we find in the solar system and some biblical miracles. And that's what we're going to cover in the next session, as I promised. We're going to talk about biblical miracles, and then we're going to tie it all in to what it means for us. All right? If you like astronomy, uh, check out A Christian Look at Astronomy, Aliens, and UFOs. There's uh, a lot more that we teach that we haven't covered. And also you might like Nephilim, Aliens, and the Last Pope. It's not as bizarre and strange as the title sounds, but it is uh, extremely interesting what times we're living in. So I hope you check those out. Go to our website, go to our blog, and uh, keep in touch with us. Amen.